Hi, welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. I'm Dr. Carl Goldcamp. So tonight we're gonna to continue with what I call big fat lies about fat around keto and protein sparing modified fast. I think you should know this and I think that's useful information without getting hopefully too technical. I wanna zip through this, believe it or not. Process oils, you really need to know about this. Process oils, so where do they come from? I wanted to compare, this actually comes from the US Department of um, what is it, Food Index, wherever I got this. Um, so we see butter, butter is fairly high in saturated fats. I'm all about dairy for saturated fats. I'm not all about dairy for other reasons. And we see that eggs have some. We have the beef. Of course, beef is going to be the pretty related to dairy. Um, we have salmon, less so in terms of saturated fats. All these blues are saturated fats. Then we come down to olive oil, which is little saturated fats, mostly this green one, oleic, corn oil, canola oil, flaxseed oil, safflower, peanut, almonds, etc. They become less, less saturated, which is kind of intuitive, and more what they call these uh, poofed as polyunsaturated fats, omega-6s. We'll talk about that. I wanted to have you, I know this looks blinding, I'm just going to like, on the right side is omega-6, on the left side is omega-3. What you're trying to be sold in this lie that I want to kind of reveal to you is that you're being told that, you know, if you have corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, vegetable oils in general, it's not a bad thing because they all become an omega-6. Well, just stop the line. Not only just, if that was true and you were, went out in the wilds and you picked these things, first of all, they wouldn't have as much omega-3, omega-6 oils, which is called alinoleic acid. They wouldn't have that much. These are highly processed GMO plants, highly pesticides, and I mentioned before that 85% of pesticides in the United States are used on two crops, corn and soy. And if you want to throw in a third, it would be canola. And that's primarily Canadian. And that's where it got its name. Canadian national oil is canola instead of rapeseed oil. They didn't like that name. So the point was, they're saying, well, look at, look at these omega-6s. We can use these. So when you go out to a restaurant, your food's being cooked and prepared in what I call industrial oils, probably canola oil. Um, and so people in the ketogenic diet, when they go to canola oil or they go to some of these other oils that are, I consider unnatural, that is, they don't want to be, I don't know why they use canola oil, but you're going to have a problem. You're going to have way too much omega-6. You're going to be way too pro-inflammatory. And we're going to get into that. Whereas on the omega-3s, which naturally come from all fish oils for the most part, and there are some omega-3s in your steak and so on and so forth, just not that much. Um, what you're trying to be sold on this side, notice more vegetables, soybean oil, canola oil, also corn, walnuts, chia, flax seeds. They're saying, well, we can make from plants, it'll be converted by humans to make omega-3s. And so we're good no matter what. We've got some omega-6s and we've got some omega-3s. Well, this is stretching the truth way too far, wicked far, as they say in Boston. Um, and really, it's only 1% of all this fat ever gets converted to, to into eventually omega-3s. And so that's just kind of a big fat lie. And you should know about that. It just doesn't happen. So when you see, like uh, we looked at the mayo, the mayo said, ALA added, ALA. ALA is this, alpha linolenic acid. Who cares? It doesn't get to omega-3. Only 1% gets converted. Humans can't make that change. Linoleic acid, the one that was on the right, linoleic acid makes up the bulk of about 60, 80% of omega-6s. Okay, some of it's natural, but most of it comes from ex exogenous sources, right? Primary contributor to nearly all chronic diseases, while considered an essential fat when consumed in excess amounts, LA acts as a metabolic poison. What it does, it breaks down your mitochondria. It gets oxidized and it forms these oxidative metabolites. Some are actually very toxic and can be identified. Over the last 150 years, linoleic acid in the human body has increased from two to three grams a day to 30 to 40 grams per day, and one to 3% of the energy up to 15 to 20%. The omega-3 to six ratio is very important, but you can't get there by simply dumping in more omega-3 by taking fish oil only. So you can't go on and have your processed foods, which are high omega-6s, and then say, well, I'm gonna balance it this way, no. What they're saying is that that's actually a very dangerous way. It's the amount of omega-6 that you are having that embeds itself into your membranes, fats, 
that is the problem. So you need to change the ratio by being conscious of what you're eating. We'll get to that. Molecular level, LA, consumption damages your metabolism. Your mitochondria specifically, it's GMO and high pesticides. Oxidation of cardiolipin. A little bit technical, but basically this is in the mitochondria. It's at the inner membrane. When it gets oxidized, all hell breaks loose. You don't have a working mitochondria, and this is the beginning of um, increasing the risk for various cancers, and certainly it breaks down your mitochondria so people are just tired. You know, you know why is chronic fatigue, not the syndrome, why are people so chronically tired? I think this might be the answer. Okay, we have linoleic acid and obesity. This is pretty interesting. If you feed mice a lot of saturated fats, they don't get fat and they don't get sick. It's only when you increase their linoleic acid in their diet from 1% to 8%, they become obese. By the way, you think that happens in humans? Do you think that has anything to do with the current obesity? You know, why are humans so heavy worldwide now? Okay, canola oil, fatty acid composition. It's primarily saturated fats, and it was touted as the healthy diet because it had very little saturated fats. Remember that 70-year-long lie that we're now kind of undoing, sort of, a little bit? 70-year-long um, lie said no saturated fats because it increased your cholesterol and increased cholesterol gave you heart disease and strokes and terrible way to go. Um, well, that was wrong. So that's why this became so popular. It was a low saturated fat. And it had linoleic acid. And it had ALA. Surprise, surprise. These are such great references to going deeper on this. Canola oil. How Canada convinced us all to eat engine lubricant. They call it engine lubricant because this is where a lot of the engine lubricant came up for World War II. You know, back in that day when everybody was having victory gardens and so on, they had to grow the plants to make canola oil and that was used as a lubricant. Once the war was over, they had an excess of oil and they needed to find a market for Canola oil, which was originally named rapeseed oil. Okay, vegetable oil is the unknown story. Nina Teicholtz, great presentation. You ought to see it. How linoleic acid wrecks your health. Great conversation. Oxidized cholesterol and vegetable oils identified as main cause of heart disease. Canola oil may promote memory loss. This is from a blog by uh, Dr. Bruce Fife, an ND. Um, Basically, it said its primary drawbacks of canola oil is the vast majority is, is GMO and is highly exposed to pesticides. Don't you think some of that comes in with the oil that you're using? Duh. And it says whether this effect is caused by the pesticide residue, the altered genetic makeup, makeup of the actual plant, or the formation of harmful byproducts, meaning the uh, oxidation is, uh, results from heat processing and cooking is not clear. It's a problem, take your choice. Saturated fat is interesting. So the whole fear about saturated fats is based on a partial truth. And here's the partial truth. Saturated fat consumption may not be the main cause of increased blood lipids. So it was associated with, oh, people who had, their, this is the one thread that Ansel Keys sort of put out there without any sort of qualifications, and that was elevated saturated fats, he's a increased cholesterol. That's partly true, but the problem is that's true only in the context of being deficient in omega-3. Huh, who would be deficient in omega-3 nowadays? Let's see, you're eating all these processed foods, maybe, um, you know, these caged animal meats. Hmm, I think it must be us. Absolutely, it's us. So the Omega-3s are known for their potential management of hyperlipidemia, meaning they bring down lipids for the prevention of coronary arterial disease, brings down heart disease, as well as for anti-arrhythmics, arrhythmia, so they're, they're used for arrhythmias, anti-aggregatory, meaning they stop clotting, they reduce clotting, People, that's where heart attacks come from, clots, and anti-inflammatory. Sounds good to me. So how much fat do I consume with my whole food sources of protein? This is me, Carl, male, Average male of 5'10", I'm actually a little taller. Um, when I have my required daily amount of whole food source of protein, what is my daily required amount of protein? Let's get into it. All right, this is from a number of other videos we've done on the protein sparing modified fast, which is pretty much how I live my life. But I don't weigh food anymore. I, I've already learned that lesson. And I know if I eat whole food sources of 
protein, I'll have the fats that I need in that, and then I'll have more fats in terms of egg yolks and maybe some MCT oils or maybe dairy. No, I don't have dairy. Twice a year, GD special occasions. Okay, so there you go. But this 162 pounds is my ideal body weight. I don't weigh this, and I hope you don't feel you have to weigh that. And this is just the amount, this is the number that I'm calculating the amount of protein that I need. I need one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. That's how I get it. Then I'll break it up over a number of different meals or snacks or whatever I want to call them. All right. Now, I extracted this from, from chronometer. And you saw some of this before. Fish, meat, poultry, shellfish, and cheddar cheese. I haven't seen that. And I broke down how much omega-6, 3, the ratio, saturated fats, and total fats, and how much would I have to eat of this tuna or this cod or this chicken to eat, so for me to have 160 grams of protein? How much chicken would I need? How much turkey would I need to eat? And that's what this whole thing is based on my 160 grams. Your ratios would be the same, but if you're smaller than me, then you'd be eating less. If you're bigger than me, then you'd be eating more. You would just look it up. Um, okay, so let's make this a little bigger. Let's look at meats. Here's your meats. I did pork loin, liver, sirloin, tenderloin, ribeye. How much omega-6 comes with those? How much omega-3s? Ratio, saturated fats, and total amount of proteins. A total amount of fat that would equal for my 160 grams of protein. Here we go. Pork is the leanest. It has the most, and not by much, has the most omega-6, but it's the leanest meat that you could eat. And this means you're stripping across, you know, the outside of the, this is pork loin, taking away the, the meat, you're not, and taking away the fat that is outside of the pork loin, of course. Beef liver. All right. So beef liver out of all the meats actually outside of hamburger is the, is the second leanest. I always thought liver was fat, but after this exercise, I learned that actually liver is pretty lean and pretty good in protein. And so, so I go down all these, we have pork as the leanest, then beef liver and sirloin, ribeye, I didn't put that in. Oh, in terms of, uh, yeah, ribeye is, once you trim away the extra fat, is not that fatty. It's the fattiest of the group here outside of hamburger. And lean ground hamburger, lean ground hamburger is the fattest animal meat you'll probably ever have. So that corresponds to, if I needed my 160 grams of pork, I would have to eat 850 calories of pork, of pork, pork loin, poor me. Um, but if I was to do it by hamburger, I'd have to have twice that amount of calories, you see? What about poultry? Cut to the chase here. Chicken has twice the amount of omega-6 than turkey does, and that probably has to do with how it's reared. So we're talking about not those revolving you know, somebody's farmer and they move the cage around and they, the chickens just eat the bugs and they live for six months to a year and they have a good life. No, we're talking about what most Americans eat, what they get in the grocery store. What they get in the grocery store is caged, um, for the most part, caged chickens. And so therefore it's fairly high in omega-6. So you change that and buy it from the local farmer, it's probably going to drop that ratio. What else can we say? It is twice as fatty as turkey, and we're going from turkey breast to chicken breast. So there you go. So if you really want lean and get your protein, it's a roughly about ooh, 150 calories difference in the course of a day of eating 160 grams of protein of turkey versus 160 grams of chicken. Beef liver, I put that in as a comparison. Salmon. So salmon, um, we'll get into the fish the next one. Here we are with fish. So cod is the least fatty fish, period. Um, it doesn't have much omega-3 or omega-6, uh, omega so I'm not even going to talk about it. It's the least fatty. Uh, tuna is also very low. I don't have tuna primarily for the mercury. I don't need it. Thank you very much. Um, the, the salmon. Now we're getting into a fairly uh, fatty fatty fish. So the salmon now has amped up a little bit and it has a good amount of omega-3, but the fattest fish you can eat is a herring. A heron, herring. Um, when I lived in Norway, they had kippers all over the time. So basically you get this in this country as canned herring, smoked, or kippers. 
and that's the fattest and the best, highest source of omega-3 is from herring. And it's the fattest fish you can have. After that is sardines, so it's easy to have, and after that is mackerel. So if you just think of herring, mackerel, and sardines, you're good with your omega-3s. They are fatty, but you don't have to have that much. Certainly have um, salmon and uh, for your other fat sources of omega-3s. Shellfish, just for the heck of it. Some people don't eat shellfish. They think it's dirty. I love shellfish. Lived five years in the Cape and we loved our clamming. Um, so clams, speaking of which, are actually the leanest of your shellfish. They also have the highest omega-3 and um, they have a little carbs. All shellfish have some carbs because you're eating their stomach. Okay, cheddar cheese by coincidence. Here we go, not by coincidence. Cheddar cheese, look at that fat. You have 132. Remember we looked at animals, milk, high saturated fats, and most of its fat is omega-6. You could figure that out. But it's an animal source. So on the grounds of saturated fats and omega-6, I don't have a problem with this. Um, it's a lot of fat, and you have to think about having it. This is your saturated fat, and this is, look at this, for for me to eat just cheddar cheese for one day to get my 160 grams of protein. Look at this, 160 grams of protein. I would have to eat really 3,000 calories of cheddar cheese. You're thinking, poor me, some of you. Um, or 27, uh, 25 ounces of cheese. That makes it more visual for you. But very fatty, obviously, um, and very heavy in omega-6. Let's do some interesting comparisons. Cheddar cheese, liver, and salmon. Why the difference? Well, on the omega-3s, clearly the salmon is the highest. The highest omega-6 is a cheddar cheese, of course. But the liver, well, the liver has some omega-6, but it really doesn't have much fat at all. Uh, as much as all the fat it has is omega-6, it really doesn't have that much fat. It's not a very, it's only as fatty as salmon. So liver and salmon are as fat as each other, fat content. But the difference is, if I ate for 160 calories of protein, I would need to eat far less salmon than I would have to eat a little liver. Isn't that surprising? Okay, now I want to get to the, that's how it looks all in all. Your fish are your best sources of your omega-3, of course. Um, your egg yolk's very high in saturated fats. Your cheddar cheese is very high in saturated fats and omega-3. And in terms of the highest fat you could have for 160 grams of protein, it would be obviously the cheddar cheese and then the eggs after that. So, so what does this look like in lab results and actual people? When, we, when, when does this conversation actually come up that we can say, you know, sir, ma'am, honey, whatever. I never say honey, um, except to my honey. Uh, and so the highest omega-6 equals the highest inflammation, the highest mitochondrial dysfunction. So let's just take a look. We looked at this before. So in the green bars, we're looking at your omega-6, your omega-3 ratio. It's a blood work that you should ask your doctor for, right? It's not like, oh my gosh, I'm doing an esoteric test. No, ask, say, I want my omega panel. I want my omega panel. And this is what you're going to get. So when we look at the highest amount of omega-6, and actually it's the ratio, it's the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. This is very tilted very tilted. I put three to one is your ideal, but it's very tilted. I want to show you the highest ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 shows highest information. Just look at the red. You know, they have, let's go down, triglycerides are high, HDL is low, which is the opposite of a good thing. Insulin's high, glucose is high. Let's go to the next person. Pretty much the same ratio of omega-6 to 3. What we have, again, high insulin, fairly high glucose, I put down homocysteine down here. Both have elevated homocysteine. And now we kind of jump down a little bit. Still the third highest omega-6 ratio has uh, high inflammation. It has fairly high insulin. Look at that, right across the board. All of them had high insulin and had moderately high glucose. So they're in different levels of insulin resistance. But I would say all three qualify as being diabetic. And not all three knew that. So... It's important. Your omega-6 to omega-3, it's not an esoteric ratio. This is a take home. It is something you need to know. You have two hands, omega-6, omega-3. You can figure it out. Hopefully you'll be more animal prone because I can, I see you can stay out of trouble that way. That's mine. And that, that's the bridge I had to cross, by the way. 
and I hope you will too. All right, so where do we get our omega threes? Well, we get it from our fish, yeah, and I've taken some fish oil as well. I take a little bit every night. This is probably the best product you can ever get. It's from Iceland. I have no financial ties to any of this. Wish I did. Um, so it's cod liver. You actually get cod liver and cod liver oil in there, and it's great. Sardines, of course, uh, mackerel, and um, the herring, we were all out. I couldn't just pull it out of the cupboard. didn't see it. Here's your egg yolks. This is some of the nutrition of your egg yolks. It's huge. Lowers risk of gastrointestinal distress, boosts immune system, lowers blood pressure, reduce risk of vision problems. And all these have more technical studies, and that's what all these are, hyperlinks. Um, the yolk is a source of the most eggs essential nutrients, of course. B12, folic acid's there too. Now back to this. This is where we started, your omega-6, your omega-3. I want you to know that it is a very big stretch of a lie, and it's wrong to say that this is healthy, and we're just having you know, plant-based omega-6 in your diet. It's now put you in such extreme. All these three people that were so high in that ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was because, without me tracking them around, but I got to see what they ate, is processed foods, and the oil in those processed foods. They go together. Okay, and then the other side, this just doesn't really convert to omega-3. That's the takeaway I want you there. I want you to know there. And that's the end of part two.